Transmitter device activated. Coordinates set for Earth 2. Hey everyone, welcome back to the Earth 2 podcast, the podcast where we explore the origins and development of the DC multiverse and the legacy of their Golden Age characters throughout the Silver and Bronze Ages of comics. I'm Peter Watson. And I'm David Steele. Indeed, welcome back. Thank you for joining us. Now, today we're going to be talking about Black Hawk. Yes. It's a sort of combination of multiversity and legacy and all that sort of stuff. Peter, tell the listeners why we're going to be talking about Black Hawk. The story arc we're going to be talking about today is actually goes over three issues, but this is the story that cements the fact that Black Hawk, or at least one version of Black Hawk, takes place on Earth-1. Black Hawk was originally published by Quality Comics, mm. who have latterly given the designation Earth-X for all their characters, but there is definitely an Earth-1 version of Black Hawk. Black Hawks first appeared in Military Comics number no. 1, published by Quality Comics, cover dated August 1941. And Black Hawk, the concept and the character, was created by Will Eisner, the creator of The Spirits. Ooh. Along with Chuck Cadera and some input from Bob Powell, all three worked at Quality Comics in the early 40s. So yes, basically Black Hawks is a popular concept at the time. It was the heroic aviators. Mm. And they were quite unusual because they were they had an international flavour to them. Black Hawk himself, originally in the comics, was Polish, but then he kind of changed quite quickly to standard American. Uh-huh. But then was retconned later on back to being Polish. Uh, <laughs> and Black Hawk's real name was never told in the original series, which is quite interesting. Uh, although he was referred to sometimes as Bart Hawk. Really? That's terrible. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> Awful. His second in command was a, a Polish acrobat called Stanislaus. And the third member of the team was Chuck. He was American, although he's been credited as being both from Brooklyn and from Texas, so go figure that one. Uh, he's the team's communications specialist. The next one is Henriksen, also known as Hendy. Yes. And he is Dutch, although he sometimes comes across as German in his dialogue. Yeah, we're going to be very respectful in all the accents that we do. The, the pages that we read through today we're gonna <laughs> yes we'll do our best <laughs> next up we have andre who funnily enough is french and of course he looks like the typical french heroic lead with his pencil thin moustache yes uh, and his suave appearance he's a demolitions expert and up next we have olaf he's the big giant strong man of the team he's from sweden and finally, we have Chop Chop, who originally is the team's Chinese cook, but basically he evolves over time and becomes a full member of the team, proficient in martial arts. His full name is eventually revealed to be Lu Hung. Yes. So there we are. That's the original lineup. Yeah. Because, let's be honest, it wouldn't be the same without a comedy, horribly racially offensive sidekick from the Far East, would it? Let's be honest. Yeah, well, that's very of the time, especially during the Warriors, even though he was Chinese, especially yes. during the Warriors. Yeah. They first appeared in military comics and they ran from there. They were incredibly popular and they spun off into their own title. But actually, it wasn't quite their own title. They actually took over the existing Uncle Sam Quarterly title and took ah. over from issue nine. That's quite exciting. That's interesting. And at the time, Black Hawk was incredibly popular. It was actually one of the top-selling comics of the early 40s. Right. It was up there with titles like Superman and Captain Marvel for popularity. Brilliant. Uh, so much so, it actually got its own movie serial. And the Superman analogies don't stop there, because the person that played him in the movie serial was Kirk Allen, who had previously played Superman in his movie serials. Yes, I, knew, I think I knew that. That's, that's pretty cool. Mm-hmm. I've recently watched the start of the movie serial, and it is... Uh, quite amusing it's uh, one of the later ones it's done in the 50s so it's not quite the golden age of movie serials it's all is done as cheaply as possible and you can tell it's it's on the on the decline so to speak wow as late as the 50s that's quite interesting you just sort of assume that they were all made in the 40s yeah there's a lot of uh, shots of cockpits with them um, obviously back screen projection and all that right and the, the actual start of the whole thing is quite funny because basically there's a radio communication the guy on the radio says, hey, where's Blackhawk? And then they introduce all the characters by having them go to the next person to find out where Blackhawk is. It's it's really quite ridiculous because uh, it introduces pretty much everyone. Is it all the same crew from the comics then? Pretty much, yeah. Uh-huh. Right, cool. So yeah, as with all these things, uh, the popularity of it kind of waned 
and Quality Comics themselves were kind of on the way out. And in 1956, they sold a lot of the properties to DC Comics. Right. And DC Comics kept some of them going, didn't they, David? Yes, the first issue of Black Hawk to be published by DC was issue 108, which came out in November 1956. But they also took over the numbering of G.I. Combat, the very successful war comic, which ran for many, many years, um, became a dollar comic eventually in the, the 70s. But they also took over the numbering of Heartthrobs, one of the romance comics, and <laughs> Robin Hood Tales. Robin Hood Tales? <laughs> yes. That amazing. obviously went down a treat. Yeah. <laughs> I kind of feel the need for us to start doing a Robin Hood Tales podcast, but okay, equally I don't, so maybe not. There weren't that many issues of it, so I think we'd be okay. <laughs> yeah, it would take us long. When everything shifted over to DC, they kind of continued much the same vein as they were before, but then gradually the stories became a bit more out there and a bit more, you know, shall we say, interesting, along the sort of lines, a few more sort of sci-fi elements and that sort of thing introduced. The team was given a revamp in issue 197, which came out in April 1964, where they they lost the kind of black leather jackets look, which had been the traditional sort of outfit, and they got these nice red jackets and green trousers, so they're all in those. And then in issue Mm -hmm. 198, they recapped the origin of Black Hawk, and I've seen it contested on Mike's Amazing World The issue 198 is the proper introduction of the Earth One Black Hawk. Uh Once we get a lot further on, when we get to some later issues of Justice League and we get to All-Star Squadron, there will be a Brave and the Bold and probably a DC Comics Presents as well that we'll talk about. It's established that Black Hawk exists on Earth 2. Yes. And it becomes something else which gets a little bit more complicated than it ever needed to be, but obviously we'll cover all that when we get to it. <laughs> um, yes. The reason that we're doing issues 228 to 230, as Pete said at the top, is because these ones feature... Superman, Batman, and Silver Age versions of Green Lantern and Barry Allen. And they so they really cement the idea that at this point in time, there are Black Hawks on Earth 1. We think it's worth doing these stories because Black Hawk is going to pop up enough times over the duration of the podcast that it saves us having to do a lot of explanation when we get there, really. So we're doing these stories because, <laughs> you know, it cements them. If you like, it almost establishes really firmly the Silver Age versions of Black Hawk as opposed to, you know... Absolutely. As opposed to the quality comics characters who were absolutely in the in the golden age. So the first comic we're, we're looking at today, as we said, is issue 228 of Black Hawk, which was published on the 10th of November 1966, dated January 1967. And to give you a little bit of cultural context, that's about a week and a half after Patrick Troughton took over from William Hartnell as Doctor Who. My goodness. There we are. So, Peter, would you like to tell everyone and myself about the cover to issue 228 of Black Hawk? I would be delighted to do so. Oh, good man. We're in 1966, so we've got the go-go checks at the top, and it says, Begin it here, the new Black Hawk era. And underneath the Black Hawk banner, at the front of the cover, we have a podium with the Black Hawks. They're all defeated. They're all in a state of injury. They've been through the ringer. And there's a mysterious figure in a trench coat and hat Mm. who is holding Blackhawk himself up above his head. And he looks like he's going to throw him right down and crush him. But behind them, we have four giant figures. And they are familiar figures. From left to right, we have Superman, Green Lantern, The Flash, and Batman. And Superman saying, No doubt of it, the Blackhawks are washed up. And Batman saying, Check, Superman. Today's villains would clobber them. They are just... Junk Heap Heroes. Yes, Junk Heap Heroes is basically the, the catch-all title for the three issues. And it's all to do with the Blackhawks getting a further revamp. Yeah. This intriguing figure in the trench coat, he looks slightly robotic, it must be said. He does. Trench coat sort of tightly tied around his waist, wearing a hat, obviously, to cover his face and his head. Very interesting. We'll see a little bit more about this guy as we go. Now, we're not doing full reads of... The three issues, because frankly, we'd be here all day. <laughs> this is just a context giver of an episode more than anything else. Bringing Black Hawk in and yeah. introducing them. Um, because it is a form of legacy. I mean, it's a character that was originally published in the Golden Age, taken up by another publisher and then being brought into the present day by you know encounters with the, the top-selling contemporary superheroes and the members of the Justice League. We think it's worth doing, at least. So Absolutely, yes. So without more ado... We are going to open, and we're going to read you the first few pages of issue 228 of Black Hawk. There's no real opening splash page as such, but we have a 
I'm an opening page which has the Black Hawk logo and the seven members of Black Hawk's team from left to right, Olaf, Hendrickson, Chop Chop, Black Hawk, Andre, Chuck and Stanislaus. But there's a sort of banner that's been stuck over the headshots and over the logo. And it says, Fitness Report Top Secret. Subject, the Black Hawks. Conclusion, washed up. The, the Junk, junk Heap, Heap Heroes. Preliminary report. So we get two panels in this opening page, and the caption for the first panel says, In a certain office in Washington, D.C., a grim, momentous meeting is taking place. In this office, we see from left to right, sat on one side of a desk, Superman, Hal Jordan, Green Lantern, Barry Allen, Flash, and Batman. On the desk are little figurines of the Black Hawks, wearing their red jackets, green trousers, and brown boots. <laughs> and Batman is conversing with the... We don't actually see his face, we don't get told his name. He gets referred to at one point as the Long L. So I don't know who that could be a reference. Is that a reference to Lyndon B. Johnson? I don't know. thought so, yeah. Mm -hmm. We can see the Capitol building in the background, just a little bit more scene setting. And Batman is saying... It's fact, sir. The Black Hawks are washed up as beans. Out of date antiques. A danger to national security. To put it bluntly, they just don't swing. <laughs> Very clearly the Adam West Batman, I think. So from the other side of the desk, the long L replies. I agree, Batman. Against the evil forces, our country, the whole world faces today. Our fighting teams have got to be rough, ruthless, and totally modern. But I'm taking steps to correct that right now. And we see that the long L is pressing a button on his desk. A transition now, a slow fade, and the caption for the second panel on the opening page says... And as that certain button in that certain office is pressed, instantly in a secret government test layer 100 feet underground. And there's quite a lot going on in this panel. We can see the seven Blackhawks standing ranged left to right. Someone in front of them who's also behind a sort of control desk. And there's a screen on this control desk which has written on it Pulse, Sweat Count, Brain Waves, Reaction Time, Improviser Index, teamwork factor score so obviously they're being assessed the gentleman who's behind the, this desk and is assessing the team says attention blackhawks meet the champ he doesn't feel fear can't sweat has never tasted defeat you've got exactly 10 minutes to show uncle sam you're not washed up has beans go go and as he says this a hatch has slid open and the trench coated figure that we saw in the cover is coming through and we can definitely see that he has robotic hands and legs. Now this guy behind the desk will tell you who he is. He is known as Mr. Delta and he's going to appear throughout the story. So over the page to page two. The Magnificent Seven <laughs> having to prove themselves? What gives here? Yes, I must say this is this tickles me. The Magnificent Seven obviously being the, the slow burning movie from 1961 starring Yul Brenner and Steve McQueen and quite a few others besides. So I do, I'm amused by these references. As a big fan of the Magnificent Seven movies <laughs> I'm absolutely tickled. So, this panel shows the Black Hawks all lined up, sort of close shots of their, each of their faces on the row, and they're all wearing little sort of headsets. It looks like a sort of little headbands that go around their head, and they look like little radio receivers on either side. And Hendrickson is the first one to speak, and he says, Donald Vetter, Black Hawk. It's just another robot. We'd beat lots of them before. Black Hawk says, Check, Hendy, but the past doesn't count. We're on the spot, the toughest spot of our lives. Get set. And in panel two of page two, the champ gestures towards the hawks and says, Don Vetta, what kind of talk is that for a modern hip secret agent? An enemy operative would spot you the instant you opened your big mouth, you old Dutch goat. And Andre says, Ma foi, it talks. The caption for the next panel. Stung by the champ's remarks, the Black Hawks sharpshooter drops to one knee and... Yeah, we see Hendrickson dropping to one knee, and if, with a kapow, he fires his gun at the champ, saying, Thunder! You can't insult Hendrickson, you refugee from the scrap heap! I drill you good, right between their electric eyes! In the next panel, Stanislaus says, By gar, Hendy missed at this range, that very strange. And the champ replies, 
Not at all, you overgrown Polish ox. Your pal Hendy is blind in his right eye, his shooting eye. He's learned to aim with his left eye. But then, from old habit, he squints that left eye shut and fires with only his sightless right eye open. He continues in the next panel. In that split second, just before he fires, it's simple for a target to move off the bullseye as I did. And this panel, Hendrickson is still kneeling down. He looks, he looks a bit, a bit scuttled. It must be said. Blackhawk stands behind him, and Blackhawk says, "Is, is that right, Hendy?" Yeah, yeah, that's right, Blackhawk. I've been hiding it from you for years, but how did this this junk joker know about it? At the top of page three, we see Mr. Delta. Now, we shall describe Mr. Delta at this point. It's kind of dark hair, swept back, a bit of a curl to it, but he wears a white mask over his face. Now, this white mask is like a white square, which covers his features completely. A little bit like the question, in what we actually... Yes, a little bit like a, a cheap knockoff cosplay version of the question. <laughs> yeah, and we will meet the question very, very far in the future. Don't worry about that. Mr. Delta is holding a microphone. He's obviously using it to guide the champ, and he says... The champ has been programmed with all your weaknesses, Blackhawk, and all your strengths. As I told you, you've no chance against him with your antique methods. Your strictly old hat washed up heroes. A modern day international crime ring would make mincemeat out of you. Blackhawk replies in the next panel. Maybe, Mr. Delta, but we're still at bat. Check. And then the champ replies off panel. Check, Blackhawk, but time's running out one minute gone. Next panel, Stan has leapt forward, grabs the champ around the waist, saying, By God, I smash you like nobody's business. And in the next panel, he raises the champ up over his head. The caption says, And as Stanislaus, the strong man of the Black Hawks, lifts the robot from the floor. Stan says, Now I make you into so much, huh, what you do to Stan's temple? Tickle me. <laughs> Yeah, and we see that the champ, who basically just looks like Robot Man, it must be yes, said. very much like Robot Man. The champ is basically, as it looks, he's tickling, it looks like he's tickling Stan on the forehead with the, the index finger of his right hand. And as he does this, the champ says, No, my muscle-headed friend, I am simply applying pressure there to your nervous system. The caption for the next panel. For a long moment, man and robot tangle titanically, and then... Stan drops to the floor. Chuck says, Yo, big Stan, he went out like a light. And then the champ speaks again. Naturally, he too has a weakness, the inability to feel pain. If he could feel it, he'd have dropped me quickly and avoided being KO'd by that nerve block hitting his brain. And then in the final panel of page three, a close-up of Olaf, Blackhawk and Andre, Olaf says, Yiminy Blackhawk. Maybe what Uncle Sam say is right. Maybe we are just has-beens walking antiques. And Andre says, We all laugh. And for the first time, I am beginning to feel an awful thing, mes amis. Fear. The grand fear. And then page three runs out with a caption saying, Are the Black Hawks really finished? Outdated heroes? How'd this happen? To find out, go directly to page four. Now, go! <laughs> okay, we're now going to summarise, at least I'm going to summarise, the bulk of the rest of the issue. The story continues as such. Following a bit of a tussle that Andre has in his training, the Hawks discuss the threat of a villain named Jolly Roger. Black Hawk arrives to tell the rest of the group that they're actually going to be Jolly Roger's bodyguards. Jolly Roger is essentially a bald man with a big exaggerated moustache and an eye patch. He looks very much like Dr. Mindbender from the G.I. Joe comic strips, <laughs> or very reminiscent of Dr. Darkness from the MF Enterprises Captain Marvel strip, but of course neither yes. of them had eye patches. But you know what I mean. The Blackhawks have received a repeated message on high-frequency video com, and we see the, the watching the message, it's a you know, video message essentially. And in the message, Jolly Roger explains that his life is under threat from unknown rivals of his, and if he dies, then a series of booby traps that he's arranged all around the world will be activated and cause, in his words, fantastic havoc. The team aren't happy about this, but Black Hawk orders them to their planes. They fly to Jolly Roger's mountain base near the coast, and almost at once Jolly Roger is attacked by an armed frogman. The Hawks take him out, and Jolly Roger reveals it was a test. 
Jolly Roger takes the hawks in his flying saucer, and that's what it is, it's like a little purple flying saucer, to attack the, the Oceana, a new liner that's on its maiden voyage. The plan is to steal a priceless statue that's on loan to the, the American government. However, another frogman steals the crate containing the statue with the help of a helicopter. The statue crate gives off a radio signal, so they pursue in the saucer and catch up to a helicopter. Chuck realises that it's a false decoy signal that they're following. It's not actually the crate they're following this other helicopter. The saucer crashes and the copter fires on Jolly Roger, but again the hawks protect him. A couple of hawks are injured and the remaining ones head off to get Jolly Roger out of the dead end canyon. A rock fall takes out Chuck moments after they find the crashed helicopter. Blackhawk climbs the side of the canyon and sights the assassin and realises that it's Lady Blackhawk in her Queen Killer Shark identity. You don't really need to know too much more about that. <laughs> Blackhawk confronts her and in the fight she bangs her head which restores her normal personality. They return to the rest of the team as another helicopter flies into view and Jolly Roger reveals he was wearing a mask the whole time and is actually, guess who, Mr Delta, the man from George. Dun, dun, dun. We now return to the story. So if you're reading along at home, go to the top of page 18 and the caption says, And when the big whirlybird sets down. Yep, that was the other helicopter that I mentioned that was just arriving and disembarking from this helicopter, we see Superman, Batman, Flash and Green Lantern. The helicopter has the George acronym spelled out on the side and you will find out what George stands for before too long. Don't panic. As the Justice League members walk towards them, Blackhawk says, Superman, Batman, The Flash, Green Lantern, I'm flipping out. This is all crazy. And Mr. Delta says, You're not losing your senses, Blackhawk. It really is them. The whole mission to guard Jolly Roger was a government test. A fake, except for the part Killer Shark and uh, Lady Blackhawk played in it. It was a test of your team's ability, Blackhawk says in the next panel. But, but, the crate with the statue, the team getting knocked out of action. The crate contained only rocks. <laughs> Killer Shark is in for a big surprise. Your teammates being knocked off only proved what was long suspected, that the Blackhawks are finished. So yes, presumably it was Killer Shark who then stole the stole the statue. Mm -hmm. That's quite funny. Blackhawk responds in the next panel. Finished? Us? And Batman says, Yes, Blackhawk. And all your fellow heroes feel the same way. That's why we were interested observers of this whole mission. Mr. Delta continues in the next panel. The official government opinion is that you're washed up. A team of laughable antiques who couldn't meet today's international super gangs on even terms. Lady Blackhawk butts in at this point and she says, But, but that's not fair. The Blackhawks did protect Jolly Roger, you, from death. And Blackhawk defeated me as Queen Killer Shark. Got a nice long shot in the next panel. Final panel of page 18. We're high up above looking down at the George helicopter. I wonder if they get them from Asda they do. and the assembled other folk. And Mr. Delta is saying, Mistake number one, they're really protected an imposter. Mistake number two, the statue was a phony. They should have checked it out. Your return to your real identity was an accident, pure and simple. And losing most of the team in the bargain, that clinches it. Your has-beens. Top of page 19. An enraged Chop Chop says, Verily, this one speaks the true jive. We didn't do so well, Blackhawk. Blackhawk says, Okay, okay, maybe we are a bit, uh, old hat. But you can't just write us off. We've been through too much together. Tackled too many tough foes. You can't just toss us in the scrap heap. We deserve another chance, right, Buster? And he's gesticulating there at Mr. Delta. Batman, standing between Blackhawk and Mr. Delta, says, We agree, Delta. The Black Hawks deserve their chance. And a thoughtful looking Mr. Delta says, Hmm, I'll have to clear it with the big man himself. And in the caption for the next panel, So that's why some days later, recovered from their wounds, the famed Black Knights find themselves fighting for their futures and their sacred honour. And we're now back at that underground testing place because we can see the champ looming up over them and Andre repeats his line saying, Sacre bleu! I feel for the first time in my life, the fear! The grand fear! And Chuck says, Me too, Andre, old me. I'm beginning to believe it. This robot joker does make us look like antique chumps. The next panel shows the Long L and Superman, Batman, Flash and Green Lantern watching the Black Hawks and what they're getting up to on a television screen. And over the television screen, we see Black Hawk, and he says, 
Calm down, you guys. So far, Hendy and Stan have shown they've got defects, maybe from years of wear and tear fighting this country's enemies from World War II on. And the watching Superman says, Well said, Blackhawk. And the Flash says, That's true. And Green Lantern says, Check! We then cut back to the testing area and Blackhawk is saying to Mr Delta, Sure, we were carrying the ball when some of you young hotshots were still in rompers. And Mr Delta says, Granted. And George is aware of your past record, but what can you do now? Can you adapt to today's tactics, tomorrow's threats? The next panel at the top of page 20 shows Chop Chop making a grab for the champ's arm, and as he does so, he says, I hear you talking, Clive. There is nothing more modern than the ancient oriental science of judo. Caption for the next panel. But as Chop Chop tries, one of his never-fail holds. So Chop Chop has made a grab for the champ's right arm. And the champ brings his left hand down, smashing it into Chop Chop's right arm. The champ says, Nothing more modern. How about karate, Chop Chop? I eat my arm! Blackhawk goes to help Chop Chop in the next panel. Chop Chop says, I, I am all right, Blackhawk. So sorry, but I let you down. Forget it, kiddo. You tried. The next panel, Andre is confronting the champ and he says, I lost, champ. What is my weakness? I dare you to find it. The champ replies, Your weakness, pretty boy. Too easy. You're afraid of girls, you big fake. And Andre responds, <laughs> Ma foi. Andre is a great lover, afraid of girls. Incredible. Nonsense. I, oh. Then the champ says in the next panel, But true, that big charm act. It wouldn't fool a top female enemy agent for a moment today. She'd see through it to that core of fear and fakery beneath. A shocked looking Andre says, No, no, it's not true. I, I, caption for the next panel. In a frenzy, the handsome Frenchman suddenly whirls and... Andre twirls and aims a high left kick at the champ, saying, You metal monster, Andre will fix you. Top of page 21 now. But then the champ grabs Andre's leg and twists it, knocking him to the ground, saying, Since what I said was true, it made you angry, and anger always telegraphs an attack, an attack easy to repel, thusly. Sacre bleu, says Andre as he's hurled to the ground. He continues in the next panel. Yes, it is true. I am afraid of the girls. I am just a big fake. In the background of this panel, a very angry-looking Chuck directs his speech at Mr. Delta, saying, You creep! Is nothing a secret from your crummy outfit? The next panel shows the Blackhawks all looking a bit rattled, all ranged opposite Mr. Delta, who's behind the desk that we described earlier on. And Mr. Delta is saying, No! Would any secret be safe from enemy agents? The champ is ruthless because the enemy is. He uses harsh psychological methods because the enemy does. It's a new world, Blackhawks, and you better get with it. In close-up, Chuck says, Okay, Buster, now it's my turn. Only I haven't got any weaknesses. I'm just a lug, an ordinary guy. There are no chinks in my armour. But then in the next panel, we see the champ. It looks like he's activated something. There's a flash of red energy around his hand, and he says, You're too modest, Chuck. You're the Black Hawks electronics expert. Therefore, you should have known there was a purpose behind those metal bands we asked you to put on. And then we see Chuck, obviously not very happy at all. He's kind of spinning around slightly. He's got his hand up to his head. He's clutching at the metal headband. And he says, Hey, I'm getting dizzy. Top of page 22, the champ continues. The bands were not only for monitoring your pulse or reactions. You should have noticed the design could also mean they could do other things, like make a man so dizzy he can't stand up. Chuck says, Stop, stop, I can't control myself. Panel 2 then appears 22, and we see Chuck with a thud falling to the ground. The champ actually looks quite happy at this, and he says, Yes, Chuck, you should have doped that out. You let yourselves and your teammates down, so you go down. The caption for the next panel says, And as Chuck lies helpless, we see Olaf rushing forward to take his turn against the champ, and he says, By Yemeni, you still got Olaf to tangle with, Mr. Robot. I ban show you a thing or two, yes you wait. And the very cheeky champ, it must be said, replies, I'm waiting, you big, dumb, sweet. Next panel shows that Olaf is 
spun himself around, so he's standing on one hand, and he says, This one band drove him just crazy at the Royal Swedish Circus. The champ is unimpressed, and he says, What were you there, an acrobat or a clown? And his final large panel from the bottom of page 22 shows Olaf cartwheeling around the champ, saying, Very funny, but you have not seen nothing yet by Jiminy. The champ says, You're right, I haven't seen anything yet. And the first three panels, top of page 23, show Olaf, without one, two, coming out of his cartwheel, bounding and bouncing against one wall, and trying to throw himself back towards the champ, who moves out of the way, and Olaf goes crashing to the ground. The champ says, Very quaint, but from his first bounce, it was ridiculously easy to figure his ultimate trajectory, to put it in words that your simple brains can understand. I knew what he was up to all the time. The final panel of page 23 shows all the Blackhawks, apart from Blackhawk himself, all down on the ground. You can see Blackhawk through the legs of the champ. The caption says, now in the underground lair, there is a silence that cannot be measured, as only one man stands facing the champ. Yeah, and as the last man standing, Blackhawk says, The team, all of them, kaputs. The champ replies, Yes, Blackhawk, you see, you are washed up, finished. Top page 24, and we're back in that government office, the caption says, and in that certain office, five very important men have almost the same thoughts. You see the champ standing on a television screen, the black hawks around him, and the observing Batman says, I'm afraid it's so. They just couldn't measure up. The Flash says, Yes, but they went down battling. And Green Lantern says, It's hard watching strong men reach the end of the road. The next panel shows Mr. Delta. He's standing in front of a little sign which is helpfully labelled scoreboard and the scoreboard <laughs> says the champ six blackhawks nil and mr delta is saying don't worry blackhawk you can retire to blackhawk island and polish your trophies george needs new blood tough fast thinking blackhawk cuts in saying hold that push button delta and then in a nice close-up an angry blackhawk says we're not out of action yet i'm still on my feet and i'm asking for a postponement i'm asking for time an intermission before we fight the last round. I believe in these guys. I believe the Blackhawks can come back. And a closing caption says, That's the old stuff, Blackhawk. But are you too late? Is this the end? Or could it really be the beginning of a new Blackhawk era? The blood-freezing, brain-numbing, nerve-snapping answer will explode in the very next issue of Blackhawk. Don't miss it, because it might really be the end. Outstanding. So what do you think of part one then, Peter? It was quite exciting. I did enjoy the use of the Justice League, although it's very weird to see them turn up in a helicopter. Mm. Superman, Batman, The Flash and Green Lantern. Two of them fly, mm. one of them runs at super speeds, and the other one's got his own method of transportation, and they're just like yes. hanging about in this helicopter to get to a place. yes. Also, all of them sitting around in an office watching television, as opposed to actually getting involved in anything, is quite quite amusing. <laughs> so. Yeah, I I was especially tickled by Batman's line: "They just don't swing." <laughs> Which is, <laughs> so it's definitely the Adam West Batman. Welcome to nineteen sixty six, folks. <laughs> yeah, I mean it's it's very interesting how they really are trying to sell it on this this angle that the Black Hawks are out of touch. Yeah, with the way things are, you know, hey. With the way things yep. are, with the modern sensibilities, mm -hmm. as an action adventure story, it was it was serviceable enough. It was quite interesting the chase through the mm -hmm. gorge and all that, which obviously we summarised. I did quite enjoy reading that. Yeah, and you know, it's it's interesting. This the American government has this ability to just sort of throw them in the bin, basically. Yeah, and they get some other superheroes into you know almost like an X Factor judging panel. <laughs> <laughs> you know, it's it's crazy. Yeah, we didn't mention the credits for these stories. They're all written by Bob Haney, which probably explains why we've got this mad sort of swinging dialogue in the stories. It's uh, quite amusing. And uh, Dick Dillon's on the art, although admittedly, some of the panels look a little bit Joe Kuberty, although it's there's no Joe Kubert in this. Um, I thought some of the faces looked a bit influenced by Kubert. Yeah, the, the the superheroes don't really look like the, the Dick Dillon you get used to from, from all the time you drew yeah. them in Justice League. Which brings me to another point. Is this the first time Dick Dillon's drawn the Justice League or at least, you know, a good quantity of them? 
It's possible. Sikowski is still drawing the regular book at this point. Yeah. So that's interesting. interesting. So we're now going to have a quick look at some of the letters that responded to issue 228. Yes. So we're going to have a look at Blackhawk bylines from issue 231. And interestingly enough, prior to this, most of the letters in Blackhawk were people looking for back issues of Blackhawk. And it was almost like a trade page. It was really interesting. Yes. <laughs> yes, I saw that in issue 228, yes. How much they're willing to sell theirs for and how much they were looking to buy for. It was really strange. Mm. But quite refreshing. The introduction actually on the letters page actually addresses that. It mm-hmm. says, So we finally came up with a solution. All you fans have been complaining about the trade corner, taking away space for plain old letters. Now you've got your wish. Blackhawk Bylines is back in full bloom with a special trade corner page elsewhere in this mag. Now, down to business. And the first letter says, Dear Editor, I'm not a regular fan of the Blackhawks, but I just had to write you for a job well done in the Junk Heap Heroes Blackhawk 228. I'd have to say it's one of the best DC mags I've read in a long time, and I'm eagerly awaiting the follow-up issue. I sure hope you aren't seriously thinking of junking the Blackhawks, because with this issue, I've become quite a fan of theirs. I'm not giving up on the Magnificent Seven. (laughs) (laughs) And that's from Kenneth Price from Ventura, California. And the editorial response to that letter is... Thanks, Kenneth. By now, as everyone knows, the Blackhawks are definitely not washed up. In fact, we think the new Blackhawk era is the greatest thing that ever happened to the Magnificent Seven. (sighs) This Magnificent Seven stuff rattles me. Because I think (laughs) the second film would have been out by now. Right. We're still about two and a half years away from my favourite Mm-hmm. Guns of the Magnificent Seven. So this is very. Uh, <laughs> I'm actually, okay. I'm, I'm tickled by all of this cross referencing. The next letter, I'll read that one, and it says, "Dear Editor, I've just finished reading number two hundred and twenty-eight, and I was really disappointed. I've been reading Black Hawk for a long time now, and the stories have been just great until this issue. Is this what comes of over twenty years of service to the nation? Is this the way the Black Hawks' careers should come to an end? I don't think so. The Black Hawks are a great bunch of heroes." And I don't think it should all end now. And that's from Ralph Demain of Buffalo, New York. And the response to this letter is... We didn't think it should all end either, Ralph. Were you really worried? We weren't. Now that you see the Magnificent Seven are going to be around for a while, let us know what you think of their new alter egos. That goes for the rest of you Blackhawk faithfuls too. Yes, of course, by this point, the fact that they're referencing to their new alter egos, that, that's a little development that we haven't quite seen yet in this, at this point in the story. But don't you worry, kids, we'll, you'll get a hint about that very, very soon, eminently, in <laughs> fact. We'll just do one more of the letters from this column, because they are pretty much saying the same thing. People are yeah. excited by yeah. the new turn uh, and what's going to happen to the Blackhawks they're concerned about, them, so that's quite good. Yeah. So the last letter I'm going to read is, Dear Editor, there is always room for improvement in any comic. And Blackhawk is no exception. For one thing, the artwork has become very grubby, perhaps purposely. Every Blackhawk looks like the popular dirty-faced war heroes. To look gutsy, a hero need not look grimy. Voice of dissension there from Irene Vartanoff, our old friend. She should be sponsoring the show by now, I think. Oh, we should be sponsoring her. (laughs) And yeah. the editorial response to Irene's letter. Anyone else think the Magnificent Seven have dirty faces? Look, they've all just died saving that Mexican village. Have some respect. <laughs> we happen to know that the Blackhawks wash and shave every morning, Irene, but surely you don't expect them to come out of their scrapes without a mark on them. Take a closer look. Maybe what you call dirt is really shading. <laughs> That's quite funny. Should we do the next? Yeah, we're going yeah. to do the next letter as well, because it's quite funny. It's quite short and sweet. The editorial continues. Sooner or later... This next question always seems to pop up. Dear Editor, where do the Blackhawks get the money to pay for their planes, submarines, uniforms, etc.? <laughs> That's from Jimmy Thomason from Zachary. And the response to that one is, aside from the fact that a number of them are independently wealthy, as the saying goes, the Blackhawks <laughs> receive a lot of rewards money for the cases they solve. Well, the magnificent, the real Magnificent Seven wouldn't take any money. And who knows if they're not moonlighting too. Honest, we're kidding. But maybe one day we'll do a whole feature about how the Magnificent Seven managed to keep themselves in business. Why weren't Warner Brothers on the phone <laughs> <laughs> saying, Paul, less of the less of the Magnificent Seven chat, please? It's very distracting. <laughs> mm. No, I became a huge fan of the Magnificent Seven off the back of the Denzel Washington Chris Pratt movie in 2016, which has many, many flaws, yeah. but it was great entertainment. So anyway... So there's some initial excitement in the response to issue 228. So we're going to continue now 
Peter, would you like to tell the listeners about the cover to issue 229? Yes, again, we've got the amazing Google checks at the top, and underneath the Black Hawk banner, the cover's kind of split in two. On the left-hand side, we've got a big close-up of Black Hawk himself, still wearing the headband with the receivers on his temples, and he's shouting at the reader, pleading with them, don't quit on us! Everyone says the Black Hawks are washed up, but you, be the judge! And on the right-hand side of the cover, there is a figure in golden armour with a skull on it and a crossed swords on it as well. It's almost like a cross between Adam Strange and the original Iron Man armour, mm. I would mm. say, <laughs> with the fin in the head and uh, the gold look. Yeah, and it's, and it's very interesting because this character doesn't appear in the issue. It won't actually appear until partway through issue 230. Yeah. I've wondered in our, in our preparation if the covers for 229 and 230 maybe got swapped around. I'm not sure. Maybe, maybe. And the caption underneath that says, You may be the Black Hawks judge, but I'll be their executioner. Yes, that is definitely preempting. So issue 229 of Black Hawk was published on December the 13th, 1966, with a cover date of February 1967. We're going to read the first couple of pages of the story before I continue with my my most triumphant summary. So jumping straight in, we have the Black Hawk banner logo and the caption underneath it that says, Here it is, the second amazing chapter of the saga that made comics history. The The Junk Junk Heap Heap Heroes! An almost thought bubble type caption now underneath that one says, Now you'll find out whether this is truly the end of the Magnificent Seven (laughs) or the beginning of a new, different, utterly fantastic Black Hawk Age. I'm getting to the point now where I'm irritated by this appropriate, this complete appropriation of <laughs> Magnificent Seven. Every single movie is the end of an era for the Magnificent Seven. I tell you, man. I remember the first time I watched Guns of the Magnificent Seven and I was absolutely depressed. I also remember the first time I watched the Magnificent Seven ride and I was absolutely appalled. There is no way that you can believe Lee Van Cleef is the same person as George and, and Real Brenner. But anyway, that's a, that's for my forthcoming solo Magnificent Seven podcast. <laughs> Look forward to that. Right, so we have yet another caption, which brings anyone who missed issue 228 up to speed. And it says, It seems an eternity ago that we left Black Hawk standing amid his battered teammates. A lone warrior who has never known defeat, but a man who is, at this moment, tasting it, breathing it, trying to keep from drowning in it. Yes, and this large panel on this page shows Mr. Delta, again, pressing the button at the bottom of his scoreboard, like he did at the end of part one. The Black Hawks are all ranged around, the champ is looming in the background, and Black Hawk is gesturing at Mr. Delta, and he's saying, Okay, so your robot creep clobbered us, Mr. Delta. I'm asking for a recess, a postponement, to see if we can come back. And Mr. Delta says, A postponement of the inevitable, Black Hawk. It's out of my hands. I must go to the top for approval. Caption for the next panel. And in a certain office, 300 feet above, at ground level. We can see Batman and Superman and Hal Jordan, Green Lantern and Barry Allen Flash and the Big L in a slightly different order from the way the last time we saw them. Still watching on television, which is now a colour television. And Black Hawk can be seen on the screen saying, Yeah, you out there, whoever you are, I'm asking for another chance. Blast it, we deserve one and our past record. And the Big L says, Black Hawk's fighting mad. I like that. But his team didn't do too well in the test. What do you all think? Top of page two. Green Lantern and the Flash are in the first panel. Green Lantern says, Well, sir, they certainly have done great service. Finding our country's enemies for years. The Flash says, Check, GL. But only Black Hawk is still fighting. And there's only a few minutes left in the test. The next panel is Superman and Batman, and Superman observes, We must remember the Black Hawks are not superheroes, just brave men who never say die. And Batman says, I'll second that, Superman. I'm no super character myself. All these guys have to offer is heart, guts, and brains. The day that isn't enough, then America, then the world, are in big trouble. There's a caption for the next panel. It says, Now fingers tap. The most important fingers in the world. The most important fingers in the world. There we go, that's a phrase to conjure with. It's clear then, I think the implication <laughs> must be that this is this is the president, don't you think? I think so, yes. Yep. So we see the tap-tap of the president's fingers on his desk, and he's saying, Thank you all, gentlemen. Now I must reach a decision, which is a lonely job. 
a lonely job. The caption for the next panel says, A few moments later... And we're with Mr Delta and Blackhawk back down in that testing cavern. Mr Delta is replacing a telephone receiver, and he says to Blackhawk, You're still alive, hotshot. You've got your postponement. I'd have washed out, you washed-up jokers, but you seem to have some awful big friends upstairs. And another caption in this panel says, Big friends? You bet he has, Buster. And this next panel, I know it's one of Peter's favourites from this whole story. Oh, it's amazing. We see The Flash, Batman, Superman and Green Lantern marching away with the Needle Washington Monument in the background. They look like a boy band doing dance moves, frankly. <laughs> <laughs> or the can-can. It's a bit ridiculous. This, this panel will end up on the socials, so you can have a look. Yes. It's quite amusing. And as they're all walking away, The Flash says, Well, I hope the Blackhawks make it. But personally, I doubt they can come back. Batman says, I remember there was an army led by a certain general, they said, could never come back from a place called Valley Forge. But they made it, and that monument proves it. And Superman says, Right as rain, Batman. And Green Lantern has nothing to add. Nothing to add. <laughs> See, so that panel's amazing. Yes. If I ever got a tattoo... <laughs> <laughs> full back it should be full back I mean it's, it is weird it's an odd panel because they're all walking obviously but the, the, the perspective mm-hmm. that it's at it's almost like they're all walking but they're all looking back the same way yeah it's yeah. it's very it looks very uncomfortable so we're not going to read the rest of 229 but I'm going to summarise it for you back at Black Hawk Island the team begin retraining because they've been given another chance Hendrickson, Olaf, Chop Chop Stanislaus who has a nice little moment with a mechanical butterfly Chuck and Andre are all put through tough tests by Blackhawk and his giant metal ant, Oscar. They all end up piling on Blackhawk, but Lady B breaks it up. They all talk about quitting. But when Blackhawk says he's going to give it all up, they try to change his mind. Blackhawk says they'll have to start again rougher and tougher. There's now a scene change to thousands of miles away in Europe. And we're with two hooded figures called Z23 and Z8, or if you're an American person, you might say Z23 and Z8. They wear purple robes. The letters and numbers are printed very largely on their chest, and they wear sort of green hoods. They look very much like Cobra Commander from G.I. Joe in the 80s. Yes. And they're all part of a huge gathering called by someone called the Emperor. We see his guards all look very much like Roman soldiers, and we learn that the crowd are all members of the top criminal gangs and organisations in the world. <laughs> this is great. We have the members of Ogre, who you might remember from issue 26 of Aquaman. <laughs> yes, the Organisation for General Revenge and Enslavement. Terrific. <laughs> and in a bit of multiversity universe splitting, we have members of Spectre from the James Bond movies. Which means James Bond is in Earth 1. <laughs> yep. Yeah, yeah. Outstanding. That's proven in showcase. Yep. <laughs> That's true. Yeah. Yeah. Members of Cyclops. Mm-hmm. Which is uh, an organisation that appeared in a Brave and Bold issue that featured Batman and Eclipso. But I think that's the only time they played. Funnily enough, they're another Bob Haney creation as our ogre. Ah, a common link here. This is Bob Haney having fun in his own toy box. Yes. Yeah. I have a niggle that, that I'm sure I heard of Cyclops somewhere else, but I've not been able to figure out where it was, so we might come back to that one day. We might not. Don't worry about it. And finally, most amusingly, some of the crowd is made up of the members of Thrush. Pete, tell us who Thrush are. You can get a cream for it. <laughs> they are the nemeses of Uncle. Mm. And I used to know their acronym. Their acronym was never used in the TV series or the movies. It was only used in the books, and it was Terrorist Hierarchy. Something, something, something. That's really, it's, it's bugging me. But yeah, the, the acronym was actually never explained in the TV series. All oh, right, that's quite interesting. I believe it was in The Man From Uncle, Volume 6. Right, okay. Read the book, if I recall correctly. It's been, it's been about 30 years since I read them. Right. <laughs> <laughs> so that's quite amusing, all these different gangs. Given all the talk of the Magnificent Seven, we're bringing James Bond and The Man From Uncle. <laughs> <laughs> into the play as well. So this, again, very zeitgeisty. You know, it must be. Yeah. You know, yeah. It's Obviously, it's that's what's in mind. So, to continue the story, the Emperor dresses probably like you imagine, very much like Julius Caesar, but in a blue robe, and he wears a golden metallic mask. He has a plan to send a message to the governments of the world by destroying the Black Hawks, and he demonstrates this to the crowd by having an eagle attack and kill a hawk. No animals were harmed in the making of this podcast. The hooded crowd 
all file out after the Emperor has made his declaration. There's a bit of a slow fade and we see Z or Z23 on the rocks outside. And he's thinking to himself, must get a message back quickly. But then he's spotted by the gladiator guards who zap him with their swords as he's trying to climb to freedom. He drops an envelope into the aqueduct that he was climbing and we see it being borne away in the water and then we see that it's found by a servant at the American consulate. The information is passed on and we see Mr. Delta and this is when we find out what George stands for. It stands for the Group for Extermination of Organisations of Revenge, Greed and Evil. <laughs> so <laughs> I love Bob Haney's acronyms. They're incredible. Think about that the next time you buy some underpants in Asda. So we see Mr. Delta on the phone to Washington and it's agreed to put a quarantine on Black Hawk Island to protect them. But when agents arrive on the island, they find that it's deserted. Agents of the Emperor also arrive and find the same. The Emperor wants them found on pain of death. Agent Delta makes finding the Hawks a top priority. We then cut to a purple flying saucer, very similar to the one we saw Jolly Roger using. And inside, we see that someone called the Listener is trying to contact someone called the Weapon Master. Uh -huh. The Weapon Master, when we see him, appears to be a baldy old man with a very thick moustache who runs a small gunsmith's shop and that shop is spelt with two P's and an E, in London, because, of course, everything's dead old-fashioned in London. <laughs> the listener warns the weapons master, who is then attacked by three of the Emperor's men. He defeats them and is revealed to be Hendrickson. The listener is then revealed to be Chuck. Now, the listener's costume is a sort of purple overall, purple boiler suit type thing, covered in <laughs> little ears, you know, Drawings of ears, it's almost like they've been screen printed on. It's quite, it's singularly, possibly the worst superhero costume I've ever seen. As we say, the listener is revealed to be Chuck, who then contacts someone called Big Eye in his special double bird headed aircraft. Imagine just an, an aeroplane, but instead of the normal sort of nose at the front, it's the heads of two black hawks. Hmm, this might be a clue. And they all decide that they must find and warn the other scattered black hawks. The issue ends with Olaf failing to get a job at a circus, because remember we saw his acrobatics earlier on, and then being followed. That takes us to the end of issue 229. Very exciting. Yes. Very exciting. One thing I want to say about this issue is the Emperor, for some mm. reason, I don't know why, he really reminds me of Victor Bueno in uh, Beneath the Planet of the Apes. I haven't seen it. I've got the box set. Do you know, I bought the, the DVD box set of the Planet of the Apes movies with the gift voucher I got for celebrating 10 years at HMV, which means in the 13 oh. years since I haven't watched it. <laughs> Gosh. I've watched the first one a couple of times and meant to get into the rest, and it is in the kitchen in my viewing pile, mm. so maybe I'll get to them mm. soon. Uh, I don't know why, because he's not actually mastering it. Well, he, he kind of is, but I don't want to spoil that. Okay. But he, he appears normally with a human face, and right. it's quite unusual. But for some reason... That's kind of like who I imagined when I was reading this story. It uh, was Victor Bueno and Beneath the Planet of the Apes. Check him out, folks. Mm. It's, a, it's a good movie. It's interesting that the, the Blackhawks have become this pawn in this massive sort of international game, caught between a rock and a hard place, as it were, between George and between the assembled ranks of the Emperor's army. Yeah. As I say, the listener, awful, awful costume, but we'll talk about more <laughs> of it. You'll, we'll talk about more of that as we go on. You'll have more horrible costumes shortly. Yep, so these are the, the a couple of the letters from issue 233. Um, the first one goes like this. Dear editor, don't quit on us. Everyone says the Blackhawks are washed up, but you be the judge. These are the immortal words of Blackhawk, the great leader of the oldest and greatest crime-fighting team in the world. What have I to say about it? No, Blackhawk, we're not going to quit on you. I've been reading Blackhawk on and off for the past seven years. And I say keep them, but make a few changes. Instead of fighting super monsters and scientists, why not change them to something like secret agents? They wouldn't have to use special weapons all the time or drive around in fancy cars. You should bring about the new look slowly, issue after issue. However you go about it, no matter what happens to the Black Ox, I'll always root for them. You can count on that. And that's from Frederick Kukla Jr. from Louisville, Kentucky. It's interesting what he says about secret agents and stuff, given how we just mentioned Ogre and yep. Thrush and Spectre and all that. Obviously, secret agents were, were very popular, mm -hmm. which is maybe why Blackhawk as a military-based team was maybe on the, on the slide. I don't know. Anyway, the response to mm -hmm. Frederick's letter. Thanks for your vote of confidence, Fred, and also for your loyalty, and have no fear. Maybe there'll be a few special weapons, but fancy cars, never. 
Good. And we're going to read one more letter from issue 233. And it goes like this. Dear editor, fantastic. The new Blackhawk era is magnificent. There's that word again. <laughs> to the most serious challenge a group of heroes has ever had to face. Look at yourselves, honestly. Then look at the world around you and ask yourselves where you stand in reaction to it. The Blackhawks have issued a stunning answer. They have finally realised that their fighting methods are old hat, that their whole way of going about the game of crime fighting is inefficient and unrealistic. But are they giving up? No. With new knowledge of anti-criminal techniques and acceptance of their weaknesses and limitations, the Blackhawks are rebuilding themselves into a team that will surely be the equal, if not the superior, of any uncle or George. What a moniker. They're making comics history. Keep up the great work, and thanks for returning Lady Blackhawk to her heroine position. We fans were worried. By the way, how about making the letter call a real one? And that's from, you guessed it, Peter's favourite, Irene Vartanov from Bethsaida. And the reply to Irene is... Irene, it sounds like you've gotten your wish on all counts. Blackhawk Bylines is now a full-fledged letter call again, while the trade corner appears on a page of its own. It certainly does. So, that brings us to the next issue, to Blackhawk 230, which was published on the 10th of January 1967, dated March 1967. Pete, say, you're on your own. Tell everyone about the cover. It's again got the fantastic Google checks at the top with Blackhawk himself hanging over his logo and he's saying, get in with the new Blackhawk era. <laughs> Dig our new secret identities. I wonder if he's saying get in in the way that characters in British sitcoms might have said them in the 90s or the 2000s. <laughs> get in! Possibly. <laughs> Yes. And we have got the revamped Blackhawks on the cover. This is so funny. <laughs> yeah. We're going to go slowly from left to right. Yes. On the far left, we have the listener, who is Chuck. Hmm. And as David described earlier on, he's wearing these overalls with the strange pink ears on them. Very peculiar. Yep. Next in line, we have the leaper. The leaper. And that's Olaf. And he's wearing a semi-armoured outfit with a big steel helmet. Yep, sort of silver in colour. Now, they're all against a very pleasant green background. This cover does pop. It yeah. really, it does, it it really does, does. out and grab it really does, yeah. Next we have the Weapons Master, who's Hendy. And that's Hendrickson, and he's in a purple military outfit, and he's carrying this rifle that seems to have some attachment on the end of the barrel. Yeah, out of all the outfits, his is the most normal looking. They could have just coloured it a dark blue, and he still would have looked like a member of Black Hawk. You know, it's, it's quite odd. Exactly, yeah. yeah. Next in line we have the Golden Centurion, and that's Stan. And he's wearing the golden armour I was referring to in the previous cover. Yeah. It's very much like, as I said, Iron Man's original armour, except a bit skinnier. Uh -huh. uh, and he has a fin in his head, and he also now has a hexagonal shield. Yeah. It's all golden in colour. Second last, we have Monsieur Machine, who is <laughs> Andre, funnily enough. And he's wearing his military overalls. And he has his berry on and two bandoliers, which are filled with tools. Yes, you can see what's obviously a spanner and maybe that must be a couple of screwdrivers. Again, yeah. they've given him a red sort of outfit. He could have been dark blue and still look like a member of Black Hawk. Yeah. Yes. And, <laughs> right, my copy, my copy of Black Hawk 230, I've, I've owned this for about 20 years. It's quite a nice copy, actually. It was only pound ninety five, and I bought it from the late lamented Peter Root and when he was in City Centre Comics. And I remember us talking about this. I think one of the reasons I bought it was because it was so cheap and because the cover was so... Uh, we thought the names were hilarious. The final member <laughs> of the Black Hawk team in his new look is, um, is Chop Chop. But Pete, tell everyone what his new name is. Chop Chop has now been christened Dr. Hans. <laughs> and he looks awesome. He's wearing a tuxedo, very Bond-like. And he seems to have two steel hands or gauntlets. You can't quite tell which is which. Yes. And that's your new Blackhawk lineup. That's the new Magnificent Seven. Yeah, it's still not as bad as, as the guys from, from the Magnificent Seven ride. i got to say, I really hope very soon we get a team up between Chop Chop and Dr. Midnight and Dr. Fate. <laughs> and we can call it the, the Three Doctors. <laughs> <laughs> Dr. Hands. Actually, Dr. Hands would fit quite well with the Dr. Fate of MF Enterprises. Universe. Yes, I mean, he does. Out of all, like, all of these guys, especially... <laughs> Dr. Hans and the Weapons Master. They look like MF Enterprises guys. Yeah. Maybe Bob Haney was taking a sort of a slight side look at MF Enterprises and going, 
Well, if they can get away with it. <laughs> Possibly. Now, listen, if you don't know what we're referring to, please go back in the feed and check out our uh, Split special on the MF Enterprises Captain Marvel. Yes. Because there's a lot to enjoy in those stories. Yes. Let us know, in fact, if you've actually gone as far as to track any of the stories down to read them, because um, that would be a lot of fun to find out what you mm-hmm. think. Yeah. We're into finally into 1967 at this point. So the story starts off with a nice recap of everything that's gone on in 229 and 228. And then we're... We're back with Olaf, who escapes from the Emperor's agents who were following him at the end of issue 229, because Olaf is now in his new identity of the Leaper. And as Peter described, the Leaper is a sort of silver-armoured fellow. There is a bit of detail, which I'll give you quickly, on on where the Leaping comes from. Um, There's a guy called Professor Nielsen who made the suit for him, and we got a nice couple of panels where the Professor goes into detail about the the rubber motors in the boots that allow him to leap around. Put me in mind of spring heel Jack, but there you go. Yes. Elsewhere, back at the Emperor's place, we are introduced to a character called Gargantua, who appears to be a sort of large robot. It's very odd. And he's being developed to attack the Blackhawks. In Chapter 2, we shift to Paris and meet Andre and his new guys as Monsieur Machine. Now, he's working a carousel at this point. I'm giving some kids a shot on it. And then this older man, very large older man, asks for a turn and then reveals himself to be Gargantua, who we met earlier on. He attacks Andre, but Andre fights back with the clawed monster on the, the carousel and with the miniature pile driver that's on the carousel. We then follow Andre after he escapes in his amphibious taxi. This is just glorious. <laughs> we go back to the Emperor and his scientist, uh, who recharges Gargantua and they have a bit of a conversation about Gargantua feeling. The next scene change takes us to Venice, where we see Chop Chop in his new role as Dr. Hands, playing and winning multiple simultaneous chess games. That's quite fun, a couple of panels. Um, after he leaves the, the building where the, the chess games were taking place, he's offered a lift in a gondola, and the gondolier turns out to be, yep, you guessed it, Gargantua. They have a fight. Dr. Hands knocks him into the canal. We then see Chuck radioing Blackhawk, and they agree to move forward the whole team's big rendezvous. So all the talk that they had about, you know, coming back and needing to regroup and come back better, they've all gone off and become their own individual, separate sort of superhero type characters. Mm-hmm. The Emperor is angry at his scientist for letting Gargantua drown, and the, the scientist sort of says he didn't really expect this to happen. The Emperor dons the <laughs> armour, as seen on the curve of 229, and also, as Pete says, on the curve of 230, and cheered on by his guards, he flies off to battle the Blackhawks himself. Part three starts with the Blackhawks all back together in the Hawk Kite, which is the name of the double-headed bird aircraft that we saw earlier on. And only Stan is missing, but as he joins the others, he's attacked by the Emperor in his armour. And this, these sequences are amazing. Yeah. You get a real sense that this is a fight-for-your-life moment. Stan gives a really, really good sort of, you know, account for himself, because the Emperor's obviously got quite a lot of extra strength in this armour. They fight, and they end up going off a cliff into the sea. And as they fall into the sea... Stan manages to remove the Emperor's anti-gravity belt, which means the armour is too heavy for the Emperor to move on his own. Bit of a design flaw, I think. Stan swims off, leaving the Emperor underwater, and (laughs) the implication is that the Emperor drowned. Yes. We shift back to the Blackhawks, and then suddenly this golden armoured figure that we've seen enters the Hawkeye. After a tussle with the Leaper, it's revealed that the guy in the golden armour is actually Stan. And as they say, he, he makes reference to the other guy who's not really needing the armour anymore. Yes. Did he let him drown or did he take him out? I don't know. Mike's Amazing World website asserts that the, the Emperor dies because he's not seen again, apparently. I would assume the Emperor dies. Yes. Yeah, so it's um it's quite interesting. Did Stan swim off, give him a couple of minutes and then go down and, I don't know, should they have factored in some sort of app <laughs> for the <laughs> for the armour that would have stopped the wearer drowning? I don't know. But anyway, <laughs> Stan is then named the Golden Centurion. And we're now going to return to the comic and read from partway down, page 23. The team are all quite happy at Stan having his new armour. And Blackhawk is saying, but you'll have use for it, pal, as the latest new identity of the new Blackhawks, the Golden Centurion. And a voice from off panel says, I'll buy that, Blackhawks. And we suddenly see that it's... Mr. Delta and the Champ. Yep, Blackhawk very helpfully points out and reminds us who they are. We see Mr. Delta and the Champ. The Champ's still wearing his trench coat and his hat. <laughs> and the, the new Blackhawks are all arranged before them. And Andre says... 
The man from George and the infernal robots that beat the stuffing out of us. And then Hendrickson, a.k.a. the weapons master, says, Dunder, you come to gloat over beating us, but we're not such pushovers now. Uh, Mr. Delta says, Relax, Hendrickson, er, I mean, weapons master. I merely brought the champ along as my personal bodyguard. You see, I've been following you, Blackhawks. Figuring I'd just have to pick up the pieces after the Emperor's wipeout boys finished you off. But I was wrong. You Blackhawks fooled me and defeated him instead. You've passed the test. I'm recommending that you be put back on Uncle Sam's fighting team right now. And off camera, a happy voice exclaims, Yahoo! We made it! And as we arrive on the final page of this exciting story, top of page 24, we have a caption that says, and that's why, some time later, in Washington... And we see The Flash, and Superman, and Batman and Green Lantern again, and they're back with the guy they were with earlier on. We see a report which is labelled, Top Secret, from George to the Long L. Subject, the Blackhawks, final report, A-OK. -okay. And presumably it's the Long L who says, You all will be pleased to hear, I'm reactivating the Blackhawks. As one of our top troubleshooting teams. Batman says, That's great news, sir. Great. And so the story concludes with a panel showing the revitalized team all in a line and a caption that says, So shake hands with the reborn Magnificent Seven, the Roll Call, the Leaper, Olaf, Dr. Hans, Chop Chop, the Weapons Master, Hendy, the Big Eye, Black Hawk, The Listener, Chuck, Monsieur Machine, Andre, <laughs> and The Golden Centurion, Stan. And as they all stand there looking amazing, chuffed and proud and strong and united and revitalized, we have yet another closing caption which says, And that brings us to the last chapter, page and panel of The Junk Heap Heroes. The series that kicked off the new Blackhawk era. If you've come this far, you deserve a reward. And you'll get one every month in every issue of the one and only Blackhawks. Hooray! Applause, crowd cheers, etc. And what's especially interesting, um, that was issue 230 and Blackhawk was cancelled with issue 243, which was published in August 1968, <laughs> which yes. says so much. <laughs> so we're going to go straight to the letter reaction to issue 230. And so we now skip to Blackhawk Bylines in issue 234 for the reader reaction, and it kicks off with an editorial saying, Greetings, Blackhawk faithfuls, as the Magnificent Seven hit the stands in their seven new identities, the comments came pouring in fast and furious, such as... Dear Editor, I have over 200 DC Comics, and out of all of those, I like Blackhawk numbers 228, 229, 230 the best. They were magnificent. I love their new identities and costumes. Congratulations. And that's from Gordon Hilly from Mobile, Alabama. What is it like to be um, stuck inside a mobile with the Memphis Blues? I wonder if Gordon knows all about that. The next letter says... <laughs> Dear Editor, please accept my congratulations for issue number 230. It was, well, magnificent. I just can't find words to tell of my happiness. <laughs> for a long time now, the Black Hawks were pretty good, but that was all. Now they surpass all of DC's other comics. Blimey. I started reading with a fair amount of scepticism. But with each new identity, I fairly jumped for joy. They really were making a comeback, and what a comeback! Wow! And that's from Greg Christensen from Grand Island, Nebraska. And the next letter says, Dear Editor, I just love the Black Hawks' new identities. I would like to know what countries the Black Hawks come from. And that's from Dave Porter, Aberdeen in Washington. And the editorial response to that is, of course, all tried and true Black Hawk fans know what countries the Magnificent Seven come from. <laughs> but for the benefit of newcomers, Andre, France, Olaf, Sweden, Stanislaus, Poland, Henriksen, Holland, Chop Chop, China, Chuck and Black Hawk, America. And then the editor continues. We wish we could say that the response to the new Black Hawk era was unanimous, but... Dear editor, it's finally been done. Nazis. 
Supervillains and assorted monsters couldn't destroy the Blackhawks, but their own creators did. At least as far as I'm concerned. They're now a bunch of super boobs who have to rely on a bunch of gimmicks. No longer do the Blackhawks rely on brains, courage, skill and a few conventional weapons to defeat a villain. The last group of normal humans, a rare thing in comics today, are now gone forever, just so they can be... in. Even if it were absolutely necessary to change them, couldn't you have at least picked better secret identities? In a word, they're just plain stupid. Why on earth didn't all those defects show up before? Certainly, such serious handicaps should have been noticed before this, and couldn't they have been corrected some other way? Another thing, how come a group of World War II vets are talking like a bunch of teeny boppers? It doesn't <laughs> fit their normal characters. It's not that I'm against progress. The Blackhawks should have been brought up to date. New weapons, training, etc. I figured you might make a few changes when that robot smashed them, but this is too much. To you, the operation may have been a smashing success, but as far as I'm concerned, the patient died. I went up with this chap before, that's Robert E. Poulin from Lawrence, Massachusetts, and the editorial response to that one is... You think this was the only one? Read on. Dear editor, you've ruined the Blackhawks by giving them new identities. I liked the Blackhawks back when they wore their red uniforms. The silliest two of all are the Leaper and the Listener. If you must leave the Blackhawks this way, please give them some new uniforms. Except for Stanislaus. <laughs> and please don't refer to Blackhawk himself as the Big Eye. At <laughs> least have his uniform and name the way they are. And that's from Kent Cochran, Gary, Indiana. And the response to Kent is... For those of you who agree with the last two letters, all we can say is that you're in a very small minority. So we hope you'll stay with the Magnificent Seven. I twitch every time I have to say that. <laughs> a while. You may even learn to love them again. In the area of constructive criticism, which we always welcome, here's an interesting one. And we have another letter which goes, Dear Editor, The Blackhawks' new identities are interesting, but I miss the group identity. I suppose, now that each one is more self-sufficient, detached service will become a bigger thing. Regarding group identity, I recommend that Stan and Olaf have the Blackhawk emblem on their super suits. That does make sense. Yeah. Certainly, Stan would want to get rid of the skull and crossed swords, and the others could very well wear their Blackhawk jackets when they were meeting together, or at least add some Blackhawk badge to their own special garb. And that's from Howard Leroy Davis, Pittman, New Jersey. And the editorial response to that is, you've probably noticed by now that we have been moving towards some of the suggestions you made, Howard. We put the Blackhawks in their fighting garb only when they go into action. For other occasions, the red uniforms remain standard. I just want to jump back to Robert E. Pullen's letter when he refers to the Blackhawks being the only team of normal humans left in DC. Obviously, Robert's not reading Challengers of the Unknown. Yes, that's true. Because they will remain the same team of ordinary humans. Admittedly, all with great skill sets, as do the Blackhawks. Yeah, and the Challengers obviously have changed their uniform a few times in a similar way to the Blackhawks have changed their uniform. But the Challengers didn't all feel the need to divvy themselves all up as individual daft-looking superheroes. I mean, the names, like the Leaper and the Listener, they sound like second-level Early 70s Spider-Man baddies, don't they? <laughs> yeah. And as we said, Dr. Hans sounds like something from, from MF Enterprises. What did, what did you think of the last part of the story? I really enjoyed the Stanislaus Emperor fight. I thought it looked mm. great. It did, really. It really did. It's incredibly interesting, the whole idea of the Emperor being killed and Stanislaus taking his uh, armour away. Now, that's one of the things that I kind of wish we'd see more of in comics because it's a bit more interesting real world thing when villains are defeated to have their tech taken away and maybe utilised by some of the heroes. Yeah. Mm -hmm. The only time I can think of that happening really in modern comics is, is the Kate Spencer Manhunter. Ah. Her costume's like a Dark Star costume and she's mm -hmm. got the, the Manhunter staff and mm -hmm. and she's got something else as well. I can't remember the third thing. I got a couple more issues of that in the post today as we record, believe it or not, listeners. I'm still looking uh -huh. for a few issues of, of that to complete my run. So if you've got any spare, you can let us know. It's a really good, really good series. I mean, what one thing I should say actually, you know, I love the layout of it. It's going to be an absolute nightmare trying to edit panels and cut panels to, to <laughs> use in, in tweets and in the socials. There's quite a few panels in Dutch tilts and things. Obviously, you can tell it is the mm -hmm. it is right in that Batmania era, sixty six, sixty seven. Yeah. I mean, I wonder how much of an influence the Batman TV series was on this. 
we talked about obviously Thrush and Spectre all being mentioned. So obviously the the secret uh-huh. agent thing was part of the zeitgeist. Yeah. So why didn't they, you know, try and maybe force the Blackhawks into going into you know secret agent undercover spy mm-hmm. type stories rather than rebranding them as odd superheroes? Which again, now that I've made the the reference to the Batman TV series, they could all be crappy. Batman TV series villains, couldn't they? Could be, they could be, yeah. Art Carney played the Archer after all. Louis the Lilac, yeah, it's very much like that, yeah. Especially the listener and Dr. Hans. <laughs> They're interesting. I mean, I again, I haven't read a lot of Black Hawk. Reading these ones makes me want to read some more. <laughs> I can't lie. Mm-hmm. So I'm going to be checking eBay for low-grade copies for whatever reason. But, I mean, it's it's interesting to note that, it. I mean, despite the fact that there was some positive response to it, you know, the comic was cancelled, yeah. like, a year and a half later. So, obviously, yeah. you know, if, if the writing was on the wall for them and they tried this revamp, then it's obvious it didn't really work. Yeah, the sales figures plummeted issue to issue after this. Yeah. Yeah, from what I've read. So, right. yeah, it it's really did not work. One thing I want to mention is this is a really interesting type of story because DC Comics at this time didn't do many multi-issue stories. Yes, yes, that's true. And most of the ones that they did were just two-parters. Mm-hmm. And this is the first time I bought, it's the first time I'm aware of that Blackhawk did it, and it's over three issues. Three issues, I know that's and insane. It's, it's a massive change. Yeah, a massive change. But you know, it's they obviously felt it was it was worth doing this way because it's a massive sea change for the direction that you know the comic yes. was going in you know obviously we should we should talk about the fact that batman and superman and the flashing green lantern were all sort of there it's almost like when patrick stewart was in the first episode of deep space 9 yes, yes you know yes, what you mean. or peter capaldi being in the first episode of class get some popular guest stars in to kind of to boost yeah. it but of course mm-hmm. none of them are on the cover so there's no way of knowing that they're actually in the stories yeah. but it's interesting how they they are obviously taking the rebranding as superheroes really seriously mm-hmm. because they've got the other big guns yeah. in as superheroes to go, right, we're going to be mm-hmm. superheroes now. And as we said, uh, the presence of the Justice League kind of cements this on Earth-1. Absolutely. But these Blackhawks say that they've been around since World War Two. Yes. We'll watch that as we go along. We will be coming back to Blackhawks in future episodes, as we said earlier on. The comic was revived, picking up the numbering with issue 244 and published in October 1975, but then it wound up again with issue 250, published a year later. Mid-70s revival. The look was, if you imagine, just a sort of 70s disco-fied version almost of the original suits. Big plunging necklines, Mm -hmm. but more or less back in the same colour scheme. I think a few of the characters died in those those stories because when the comic was revived, again picking up the numbering with issue 251 in the summer of 1982, everything was back in World War II again. Yep. We're not really sure if that was meant to be a reboot or a retcon or if that overwrit or if we were seeing the Black Hawks or another Earth. I mean, you could make the assumption, because they were originally published by Quality, mm-hmm. that they were on Earth X. Yes. And again, this is getting ahead of ourselves because when we first meet the Quality characters in the DC Comics stories, when they're introduced in the JLA, JSA team up, it's established that Uncle Sam, Dollman, etc. are on Earth X. And because Black Hawk mm-hmm. was published by the same people, you could assume he was Earth X. But then way, way in the future, in the pages of All-Star Squadron. We haven't mentioned All-Star Squadron for a while, written by Roy Thomas. Roy, obviously, making his, his own rules and playing in a toy box, he uses the Blackhawks and establishes that they're on Earth 2. Yes. But then, of course, there's the events of All-Star Squadron issue 50, but that's way, way, way in the future. We'll get there. We'll get there. Chances are, if you listen to this podcast, you probably know what we're talking about, but we're trying to be as linear as possible and just chart everything as that happens. So at the minute, just from reading the stories, you know, as Pete says there, these guys were active during World War Two and were active on this Earth. So, for all intents and purposes, as far as we're concerned at the moment, from what we've seen of them, the Blackhawks were always on Earth-1. Certainly looks that way at the moment, yes. Mm-hmm. Especially, as we say, and we're labouring the point, because it's why we're doing this issue, <laughs> the presence of Barry Allen and Hal Jordan really does back that up. Mm-hmm. As we say, though, Blackhawk will be back. There's at least a Brave and the Bold, and there's at least one Justice League story, and as we say, they will feature in the All-Star Squadron. And then after the crisis, and after... Many other series, which we'll probably tell you a little bit more in the future. Um, Black Hawk turned up for four issues of an arc in Sandman Mystery Theatre, which we have mentioned before in the past as well. And that rebooting him as being you know, a flyer from Poland. So that's quite interesting. But as I say, there will be some more Black Hawk at some point in the future. So, But that's what we thought about this amazing story arc. What do you think about it? Please get in touch. You can email us at theearth2podcast at gmail.com. We'll be selecting some highlights from all three issues. 
and perhaps some other bonus material to put up on our social media. So make sure you follow us on Facebook and Instagram. We're at the Earth Two Podcast, and on Twitter we're at Podcast underscore Earth Two. And it's the number two in all our social media. So I've been Peter, and I've been David. Thanks for listening. We'll see you next time on the Earth, the Earth Two, two Podcast. Podcast. Transmatter cube activated. Return coordinate set for Earth Prime. Then we see that the champ, who basically just looks like Robot Man, it must be said, it's it's, it's quite distracting. Robot Man is, <laughs> I'm even saying it myself.